welcome to the Brain and Transcranial Photobiomodulation Virtual Summit. I'm Dr. Joe Dodaro, your host. My guest today is Sarah Turner, who has a Bachelor of Science in neuro, bio, Biological Neuroscience. But, and uh, she's postgraduate qualifications in clinical neuroscience. She's probably the only speaker that we have that was involved in the making of the movie Biohack. And uh, she is a uh, working with the company to help commercialize transcranial photobiomodulation. She brings to us a wealth of uh, research and insights into this. And I want to welcome you, uh, Sarah, to our program. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. And it's a great joy to be on. Tell me a little bit about how did you get started? I mean, you know, I'm from the biohacking community also. We're all quantified. We want to measure things. What is it that you, how did you kind of walk, walk me through your path to arrive here today? If you will. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, I started off many, many moons ago um, as a research scientist for pharmaceutical companies. That's how I started off. And I was looking at things like electrostatic charge and how that affects drug deposition. Uh, and I kind of started to get the understanding that it's, it's about the body rather than, you know, about the drug. You know, how your body is determines how that drug functions. So I went on to study nutritional medicine and various other things that are kind of more about focusing on the health of the body. Uh, and then I moved to California and was kind of up here, Silicon Valley, where I'm now sheltering in place temporarily. Um, and of course, Silicon Valley is all about biohacking. And I got involved with some of the biohacking stuff that was going on here. And as you said, was kind of involved in making a movie about it. And making a movie kind of got me into things like how we are affected by our environment. Um, and light to me was the most important and interesting out of all those things. And also the most intuitive. Hmm. So that's kind of a very potted history. I like <laughs> it. I think we're going to touch on it when we look at your slides. So uh, uh -huh. go ahead. Let's go ahead and share your slides and take us a walk through. Sure. Let's. Okay, are we all good, Joe? You can see that? Looks great. Cool. Cool. Okay, so let me just talk a bit about my credentials for being here today and talking to you. Um, so I have had a little bit of experience with photobiomodulation. It's, as you know, a fairly new science, so a lot of the stuff is kind of very recent. Uh, one of the most interesting things that I did recently was get some hands-on experience with uh, Dr. Marvin Berman, who I believe you're also going to be interviewing. And uh, that was over in Philadelphia looking at photobiomodulation and uh, Parkinson's disease. With this rather strange helmet you see depicted here, this is like one of the um, trial devices. Um, and while I was in England, I'm from England, and I, of course, took James Carroll's very interesting course with Thor Laser. Uh, learned some very interesting stuff there. And while I was making um, the movie and gathering information on that, I also met some very interesting characters who kind of had maybe a more alternative view on the science behind photobiomodulation generally. So I've got a few slides on. Um, obviously, I met lots of very, very interesting people, and there are so many people doing interesting things. But I think maybe from a slightly different point of view, Professor Jerry Pollock, who's at University of Washington, um, Jack Cruz, May Ran Ho, Fritz Albert Pop. Um, he was an interesting guy that I actually met on a prior movie project looking at biophotons, which again is, you know, a very interesting and related subject. Um, and since then now I'm kind of trying to pull all that knowledge together and I'm now working for a, a small company that's looking at making products for home use. So here's some of the characters, uh, and I'm sure you'll recognize all of these characters here. And these, uh, like I say, these were all uh, people that I met during making various media and movies on um, specifically light and interaction with biology. Um, so one of the more interesting things that, that I was focusing on at the time that I was doing this research is water. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, through the course of your program, you're going to have a lot of people talking about the mechanism of um, how photobiomodulation works. And there's a, there's a lot of information I'm sure you're going to have on um, cytochrome C oxidase. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. I just wanted to, I just wanted to give you maybe some alternative chromophores because the chromophore is 
the morality in the body that accepts the light. Because obviously, unless you have something in the body that receives the light, then you know you don't have an effect. So one of the more interesting things that I was looking at was water, uh, because water is a chromophore too. You know, water does absorb light. Um, if we're talking about light in the body, it tends to absorb more in the higher end of the near infrared range. So we're talking probably 940 nanometers plus. Um, and that's fascinating to me because of course we, you know, we're, we are made of water, you know, the brain is 75% water roughly. So the fact that water absorbs light, you know, th there has to be an effect there. Um, and at the moment there is some research going on in this. Like I say, it's not the main focus, it seems, of the mechanism but um, certainly different people are looking at water as a chromophore and maybe an explanation of how some of these effects are happening in the body. Mm -hmm. um, vibrational energy, and here I'm talking about water clusters and how that may open heat-gated ion channels. Um, modulation of calcium getting into the cell. Um, Charge separation, which I'll go through a little bit more when I talk about Professor Jerry Pollock, because that's his uh, big research subject, is how light causes this charge effect in water. Um, and also how water changes in relation to, you know, the surface that it's against in response to light, you get this charge separation effect. And what that means actually for how things work in the body, particularly mitochondria, which is where you produce energy. And I'm hoping my little video will work. This is a very simple little video, but, but I think to understand that, you know, ATP, which is um, ADP and the conversion to ATP, which is where you make energy in the body, it is actually like a little spinning motor. So if you imagine you, you are changing the viscosity of the water around um, these organelles and, and, you know, internally inside the mitochondria, you can actually change the efficacy of this kind of machinery inside the cell because you have this different effect of the viscosity of the water. So Sarah, so, Sarah if yeah. I could just jump in for a second. No, of course, this is a, a part that has to be dealt with when you're looking at the higher frequencies, nanometers or wavelengths of light. And uh, there's a this is a beautiful video. I'm glad it's running and that we're recording it. But the thing is that this, this uh, is perfect because the gear that you're showing here, it's sort of like a gear and it's, it sits in the membrane this way, you know? Yeah. And you think about this point that you're bringing up, the viscosity or the fluidity of it. Think about it as oil greasing that gear. <laughs> so Exactly. Oh, I just wanted to interject because no, you know, please do, please do, Joe. I, I raise uh, my hand. I'm going to interrupt. Go ahead. Yes, uh, that right? would be very cool. Yes, because you can help clarify some of these points. That's right. The water, when it when it's next to an adjacent, when it's adjacent to a membrane, it does charge separate. So you're right. It becomes more viscous and it allows everything to flow more easily. And Yes, it allows this ATP to spin, but also if you imagine it along all of the blood vessels, you know, it's lining all of the blood vessels and things that everything in the brain, of course, the blood is going to be able to flow more smoothly. So, you know, there's quite a lot of different effects that are possible when you're getting this kind of charging effect in water. Uh, and, and like I say, this is mainly Professor Jerry Pollock's work, and this is uh, information. I actually went to uh, Jerry's lab and I was able to see, you know, he actually, uh, he discovered this by, you know, having light shining on Nappian tubing, which is kind of like something that's analogous to a membrane. It's a charged surface too. And so his discovery was, was fairly accidental actually that showed you have this very interesting charging effect when you shine light on water next to a charged surface. Um, the water actually changes its structure and it becomes, it becomes sort of like ice, but without the kind of connecting um, hydrogens. Yes, you're raising your hand, Joe. <laughs> so the, the question, I didn't quite hear you. You said when you were there, mm -hmm. the light was shining on what? 
Nathian tubing, which is which is what he was using to do his experiments. It's it's um it's a material that's kind of analogous to membranes in the body. Right. It's like a, a charged material because he's a material scientist, really. He's not a biologist, you know, he was really looking at um, water and different kinds of materials. Correct. So the easy water has a structure that's a little bit different, H3O2 instead of H2O, mm -hmm. and right. that's the fourth phase of water. It's more viscous, correct? You said mm -hmm. it there. And has a negative charge and is highly capable of holding and delivering energy. And sunlight and infrared light causes the easy water to form an adjacent to a hydrophilic membrane. So if I'm understanding this, the light kind of is reflecting off the membrane and the and the water, and it forms this easy water. It forms easy water, yes, and it's um, it's easy because it's exclusion zone. That's where the easy comes into it. And but you're, because, you're saying this is more viscous than it's thicker. It's it's more slippery, yes. So that's less viscous. That's the point. Right. More viscous means it's thick, thick, thick. Less viscous means it's more thin. Just to clarify that. That's why I read that. I'm not going to read all your slides. You know, I had, do you know, I had it the other way around and then I checked it and uh, uh, the so when I was looking back at one of the sources I had here, I changed it. But what it definitely, whichever way around it is, it means it becomes more slippery. Mm -hmm. And the reason it becomes more slippery is because it forms like a lattice-like structure, like ice, but without the without the interconnecting bonds, so it's not a solid. It's more like a gel. Like so it, it, it perhaps it, when I'm saying more viscous, I mean it's kind of more viscous in that it is gel-like actually. So the water would be more gel, but and, and and that's more a little bit more viscous. So, so I got that part, but it's because it's holding on to more charge. Correct? Yes, it's because it's pushing the protons out because it pushes. Some of the protons out, that's why you get this change of structure. So you have this kind of structured water that's next to the surface. And then the, the additional protons are pushed out into the bulk water. Gotcha. It, yeah. I like it. Keep going. And, and it's exclusion zone. Because you have this fairly tight lattice structure, it's, it's, it's much more structured. Solutes are also pushed out. So the water is very, very pure in that you have it's excluding any other solutes. So you have this very pure gel-like charged water next to the membranes, next to all of this mitochondria stuff and all the gears and everything, like you say, that little motor that's spinning in there, but also next to the blood vessels, so the blood is traveling more efficiently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like so, the, so just it, to say, this is the, this, to talk about your graphic there, we have a solid, a liquid, a vapor, and then this fourth phase of water, which is sort of like the a little in between. I like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's like a gel. Yeah, it's like a gel. Um, and so that's, that's very interesting when you think about how the body works and you think how efficient the body is and you know how we really have evolved to be under light we've evolved to be under sunshine you know it's no accident that that, that it's red and near infrared light that's charging the body and causing all this amazing stuff to happen yep. and it fits so well with the concept of charging because really when you have these two lights you're, you're really having a charge in the body it really is like a battery you know it's a way of gathering energy in the body it's kind of and pollock in his book has a really lovely analogy of a body battery it's a very accessible book i highly recommend it he has these lovely drawings of little batteries and it's showing you that this is an alternative way that the body actually gets energy perfect yeah uh, and then um lovely may Wan ho unfortunately um Mayran has passed away, but I was able to go and visit her before she did so. And we had some amazing conversations about quantum coherence. And she is talking again, mainly about water and light and the interaction, but how the body is this whole system. So you have this additional energy that you're getting from light and the interaction with water. But in Mei Wan Ho's view, it's kind of shared between all the systems of the body. You know, you have this totally energy efficient way that the body uses this energy. 
and she talks about kind of interconnected systems and the body's kind of like a, an open exchange environment. So again, this is kind of a little bit more alternative way of looking at how the body uses energy from light. Liquid crystalline state and that enables molecules to line up and move coherently together. Mm -hmm. so quantum coherent domains in the water. So I'm not like, this is new to me. So, so energy is always flowing. Everything is interconnected and water is the message, correct? Mm -hmm. Water is the transmitter of this quote unquote vibration. Am I correct? Or is that how it's yes. followed? Yes. She he sees the body like a liquid crystal, you know, so you have this, um, are, you, are you familiar with the concept of the living matrix by James Oshman? Not a hundred percent. I don't think. He has this, you know, it's a theory that you have, the whole body is interconnected. And so this enables this kind of quantum because you have this like quantum, like non-local transmission of the energy. So almost like a, a kind of liquid crystal, you know, where you have these kind of free electrons that are able to move from one place to the other, you know, almost instantaneously. And, you know, you can have this effect of a, a crystal where you can kind of squeeze it and you get this piezoelectric effect where you have like the kind of electrons disperse over the body. This is the same concept of May Ran Ho and James Oshman, that you have this kind of the body is able to share the energy fairly rapidly, you know, over the body because everything is connected by water, like water acts. And this is a new, again, this is a new systems approach to this because that's one of the ways that earthing or standing on the ground immediately changes the polarity of your, at the top of your head. And they said that, there, well, there's no nervous system that works that way, that mm -hmm. way. So it's right in that, in that whole thing about the, uh, in, in the energy disbursement very well of course yeah it's electrons i mean when you're standing on the ground you're getting electrons up from the ground and of course you know as soon as you change the charge there it has this effect over the entire body and interestingly you know i started off by saying you know way way many moons ago i was working in the drug companies looking at electrostatic effects you yeah. know i kind of thought fairly early on then your, the charge that you have in your body totally dictates, you know, the way other systems work in your body. If you're not grounded, your lungs will work differently. Everything that has water will work differently uh, if, if you don't ground or if you don't have any connection to, to kind of earth. Our natural yeah. world. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah yes, of course. Well, it, yes. Um, and this is another very interesting um, character and this is some work on biophotons and actually Fritz Albert Popp, uh, he's a German guy, he did some of the initial work on biophotons by putting people in a very close dark room and using a, a very sensitive piece of kit called a um, biophoto multiplier device. And he was looking at the body and he's looking at very, very weak emissions of light coming from the body. So we're talking about putting light into the body, but also the body emits light also. And the reason I wanted to talk about this, Joe, is because when we talk about shining light in the brain, you know, there are a lot of things which are still a little bit of a mystery, like how can you get light right deep in the brain? How do we see these amazing effects when actually we don't even know, you know, how the light's getting in? You know, there's, there's still a lot of mystery. And I think maybe some of the effects of things we're not really looking at is that you can have an effect, you can shine light, but it could have a cascading effect. And if the body is kind of communicating by using these biophotonic emissions, very, very low level, they're kind of a cumulative effect. And this is something that is being explored. Um, but again, it's kind of a very new thing. It's very difficult to do this research. You need very kind of high tech kit to do it. Um, but this was the start of it. Fritz Albert Pop was the start of it. And, you know, before that, there was people like Gerwitches and, you know, who were looking looking at emissions from they were doing plants but hum, anything living emits light anything living emits light so did you go to did you have a connection with Fritz Pop did you did you visit yes, I did I went there I went in his box I kind of did, looked at the testing I, I spoke to him he was you know the, this was his life's work and it's an amazing discovery actually that we emit light you know it's that's something that's not overly intuitive and we still don't entirely know what the significance is of that you know are we communicating on some level that we're not even aware of by biophotons you know 
Of course yeah. we are. I mean, of uh, course we are. Of course yes. we are. I mean, think about it. Think about it. They, you know, acupuncture has been around for five thousand years. What did they? Mm -hmm. What did they measure? What did they see? How did they perceive this? Because they perceive something that maybe in our language, in the way that our we've been developed, that we don't see it anymore. Now maybe it was ability to see these things because I'm sure you, Fritz Pop has a picture of somebody with the, the aura, you know, with the halo. I'm sure he's got pictures of that. I mean, it's nice that we have the hand, but you know, I've, I haven't really delved in, you know, looked very deeply at this, at this level of research, but it's true that the body gives off light. We are beings of light. So it's true. And it's very interesting. It seems that the, the source of the light the, uh, mainly is the mitochondria. And also potentially the DNA, mm -hmm. you know, so that's very, it's very interesting. You know, we're kind of thinking that the red light therapy and photobiomodulation, you know, the main receiver of that light is the mitochondria. And now we're learning that the main emitter of light in the body is also the mitochondria. Uh -huh. You know, so, so, I mean, I, I go to a lot of, I go to a lot of uh, conferences and I recently went to one called the Science of Consciousness, where I met a chap who was doing some very interesting research, looking at communication between bacteria. And he found that, yes, they are communicating via, it seems, by this biophotonic emission. At least one aspect. I agree. You know, at least one aspect. Go ahead. Uh, Yes. So, so this is this is what this is my point on this slide is that the mitochondria are not only light receivers but also transmitters of light. So when we're thinking about how photobiomodulation works, and this is kind of the standard model that we've got so far, is that the light is absorbed by cytochrome C oxidizing the mitochondria, and then it has all of these effects. You know, also within that we have these maybe slight, very subtle additional effects that. Are beginning to be researched, but quite are not quite in the mainstream research yet, just because of the complications in doing the research. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to point out that while well, maybe we're going to get there, but in uh, in in the research that we uh, put out there, we looked at also. We're going to talk about this in the conference: is the blood, the fluid, the plasma. Yeah. That is something that we know that we can touch. At least we can touch the skin. So that is an area that, you know, a blood, red blood cell doesn't have a mitochondria, but a lot of other stuff in there does. And that's really what we're focusing on these days is, you know, blood and blood tests. So we have the ability, you know, from our research to see that the blood can be, the, blood, the plasma and what have it can be charged a little bit and then that tissue can give off its you know, light uh, uh, bioluminescence or biofluorescence as it goes downstream. So I am, uh, this is one thing when we get into the cellular level of the mitochondria, I agree, but there's other levels that are being, will be expressed as we go forward. Please go ahead. Yep. And, and also it was interesting to read the other day that there are, in fact, <clears throat> although you say red blood cells don't have mitochondria, there are free floating mitochondria in the blood that, you know, that's new research coming out. So again, that's kind of a, I totally agree. The blood is now becoming this kind of site where you're having all of these effects from the photobiomodulation. Um, Dr. Jack Cruz, uh, he's someone else that I interviewed uh, quite extensively for some of the media products I was doing, and he has a, his own unique take on the interaction of light in the body. Um, he's very focused on circadian biology, um, but again, that makes perfect sense from okay this is how we have evolved as land mammals you know we've evolved under the sun this is what the the light is doing and this is kind of i extrapolated a lot of my kind of learnings about photobiomodulation from his explanations of circadian biology um, and he puts out a lot of very interesting information about like you say different kinds of factors where you have different kinds of chromophores in the body and what they may or may not be doing um, specifically things like melatonin, um, which is now becoming a bigger topic because melatonin is kind of implicated in um, coronavirus. You know, people are seeing there seems to be a link there with the more melatonin you have in your body, the more able you are to kind of fight off viruses and things like that. So that's very interesting. Um, and of course, the body makes it in response to sunlight and near infrared light. Um, he looks... I mean, he even goes to, he even goes as far as to say that your light environment is more important than your food environment. Like, you know, what you're getting 
for your light is more important than what, what you, you're eating, which, you know, it's a bold statement, but it's very interesting to kind of have that concept. You know, it's a bold statement, but the point, the point that he's making is that there's a, you know, we have to be aware of good light and bad light. And it's the same, you know, photobiomodulation is as Dr. Hamlin points out, I mean, it's the sun is the sun and then everything else is what, you know, if you're under bad light, there's, there's good food and there's bad food, there's good light, there's bad light, there's dose. And so it's not too far off from the science that we're talking about. Go ahead. Yeah. And so that's kind of just a bit of a summary of some of the people that I've kind of been following along and kind of had the privilege to talk to on these various subjects. Um, as I said, I'm now trying to pull all this information together and I'm now uh, working for a, um, a startup energy medicine company uh, based in Thailand that's very interesting. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the research that I'm doing with that company and some of the things we're discovering. And, and also actually there's a lot of, um, a lot of places where we're kind of looking for input on, on the various um, specifications that go into making these kinds of devices, because as you know, there's a lot of information and it's very difficult to see, okay, what is the exact wavelength? What do we need to do about pulsing? You know, what about accessing the brain? Where's the best site? You know, which of these many different research projects or, or, or data, you know, is the one that we need to look at? Because I think one of the issues with photobiomodulation research is that there are so many variations that you can do with varying pulse and dose and irradiance. And sometimes the terms aren't comparable. And so um, that's where I'm at with this. So I'll just quickly, if you don't mind, like go through where we're at, uh, and then of course, open for input. Um, so the first, the first thing to look at, I think when trying to make devices in this field is actually how do you get light into the brain? Uh, that's kind of the first uh, thing to look at. And uh, from the point of view of, of where we started from, you know, getting light into the brain is, is difficult if you're talking about transcranial and sometimes maybe getting light into the body might be an easier access. Um, and as you know, you know, the body is totally interconnected. You can't, you can't do something to one part of the body and not have an effect on the other part. Everything is linked. There's the gut brain axis, there's the heart brain axis, there's the, you know, the fascia. Um, all of the body systems are interconnected. Um, of course, if you're looking at the vagus nerve, it's called vagus because it's wandering. It goes all up around the body. You have that. You have also the microbiome. You know, we're, we're not just made of human cells. You know, we've got bacteria and viruses. All of these things are having different effects in the body. And as you said, blood and fluids are now becoming something that people are talking about more with photobiomodulation. So, um, we're, what we were mainly looking at with recharge is maybe targeting the gut as a first instance to get into the brain. And this is predominantly because this company, you know, it already, we already have a device which is a body device. So how, you know, how do you actually target your brain by putting something on your gut? It does, doesn't seem as if that's, does seem a little bit counterintuitive, but actually there are a lot of connections between the gut and the brain. Well, I want to say that we have, we are blessed and lucky enough to have the two researchers uh, they are pioneering this field and their, and their new company is actually coming out, which uh, kind of broke this all down in the, in the rat model or the mouse model. And, mm -hmm. then forward, and they will be speaking on this extensively. So this is a, you know, you're bringing this to the awareness of, of the people. That was the, uh, uh, that yes, I think all these mechanisms are, are valid. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I, yes, I cannot wait to hear those. You've got such a brilliant lineup <laughs> of speakers. Um, and yes, of course, you know, a lot of what I'm saying here is drawn from the, from research of, of those exact people that you're going to be interviewing. Um, but just to summarize some of the things that are happening in the gut that kind of have a, a, like an effect on brain health. Um, of course, you know, 
there is a brain in the gut, if you like, you know, there are neurons in the gut. And so if you're shining light, you know, the light's going to have effects on those neurons the same as it would the neurons in your brain. And in fact, a lot of the brain chemicals like serotonin, you know, it made predominantly in the gut. Um, I point this out because I made, it, I made a topic about this. I don't want to point this out that yes, accessing light to the body is going to have an effect on the brain. And then remember this, that the serotonin that's made in the gut is not accessed by the brain. It's not the same serotonin. Mm -hmm. But the point being is it may be activating the vagus nerve, as you talked about. It may be stimulating or soothing the vagus nerve, which will change the tone and integrity of that. So that's a, that's a, dir you know, a direct stimulation if, in fact, we are changing the serotonin levels, which I'm not sure that has been demonstrated that light is going to change the serotonin levels on the belly, but it's a different one. So I don't want to, I want, I want to say that, but remember, you may not be aware of one of the earlier papers that looked at back pain and putting devices very similar to yours. They put them on the people's back mm -hmm. and their depression went away. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, right there was a connection of something about something about something. So I, Good. This is a good slide. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yes, like you say, vagal tone, uh, vagal tone. Yeah, immune cells. You know, there is some evidence that you can cut. You know, when you're um, activating the immune system, you know, even if you're doing it systemically, you know, that's having a knock-on effect with what, what's going on in the brain, and you can be protecting the brain potentially for, from damage there. Um, the endocannabinoid system again that there is some evidence to show that the red light therapy has this effect on the endocannabinoid system which again is very intrinsically linked to the immune system in the brain um blood irradiation which is something we've talked about but i think like i say that that recent study that showed that there are free floating mitochondria in the blood and not only that but they actually can migrate to different areas where they're needed again that's kind of a pivotal study for looking at you know maybe having these effects systemically and also um, the, the healing effect of red light because sometimes I think people think that red light is only superficial and so it's not going to have the same effect it's only for wound healing but if you're thinking about targeting the blood you know there are lots of places on the body where the blood is fairly near the skin that you know red light is going to have an effect there. I'm going to point out that that you the red blood cell as we talked about in our uh, in therapeutic potential of intranasal paper mm -hmm. that remember red blood cell does not absorb red light mm -hmm. so it's a different mechanism it's something else to understand that it's not this, the way that you know put the light on the red blood cells. it's a little bit there's and as i said it's a little more complicated than that but go ahead yeah well the red blood so I'm not talking about the red blood cells. I'm talking about the mitochondria that are potentially in the in the blood that are kind of circulating with the with the red blood cells. Um, fat reduction I've put here is a little question mark because again there is very you know there isn't a great deal of research, but there is some research to say that you can have spot fat reduction where you put the put these devices, and I know that people do use it for that application. And of course, you know the less you have in the body the more healthy you are generally you know to a certain level so things like you know general health you know if, if you can kind of cut down the fat content of the body certainly around the middle there you know that is another potential where you have a knock-on effect so a secondary effect not like a primary effect on brain health uh, and of course it's easily accessible it's easy to put a device here you know you've kind of got this nice open space where you can put a device so again that's a benefit for using a device there compliance you know people people can do it easily um and yes there are some there are some very interesting studies on mouse models with alzheimer's where they're shining light onto the abdomen of the animals and getting this effect I've put the reference there. I can also put the reference to these papers at the end because, as you say, a lot of the people who are authors of those papers are people that you're going to speak to. So, you know, that's very cool. Um, photobiomics. Again, this is kind of a new science that's coming out looking at the effect of light on um, the bacteria and viruses that live in the body. Uh, and this is very relevant to brain disorders because, again, the link between 
um, the gut microbiome or even just the general microbiome in the body and brain disorders is you know getting stronger and stronger there's a lot more evidence for that um, in addition you know if your body has got an overload of bacteria it's kind of overloading the immune system and maybe kind of stimulate that that kind of autoimmune response um, gingivitis you know there's been more and more linked to things like bacteria in teeth and swallowing that and then that leading to particularly Alzheimer's there's a lot of um, evidence for that um, coming out um, viruses certain viruses are implicated in brain disease Certainly things like herpes can cause encephalitis. You know, you can get a lot of brain noise from viruses floating in the blood. And, and maybe even if you're thinking about dementia, the, um, the peptides, that they may be a response. You know, you have these plaques and tangles in the brain. There's, there is a theory that, that those form as a response to kind of uh, overactive microbe activity in the brain. So, so this is an important subject to look at you know if light has this effect on the microbiome and then the microbiome has such an effect on brain disorders you know to consider that link and and look at the research there so now i'm just going to quickly talk about this device that, that we have so you can uh see what we're trying to do within this company so this is a this device we have at the moment it's called a flex beam and it's called because it flexes around the body and the reason for that is, as you know, the further you get away from a light source, the more the, the radiation drops off and the less light you're actually getting into your body. Um, so in order to get like a, a consistent and concentrated dose of light, really you need to have the device pressed up against the body. And that enables, um, it, it enables the full dose of light to, to penetrate. Because, and also the angle of penetration is fairly important when you're talking about red light. You want something that curves around the body. I have to say that that is, I have to agree with that science. Go ahead. So this is the reason for this particular device. Um, it's red and near infrared. Um, it uses medical grade lasers and it's, it's actually quite a high output device. So you can have a fairly high dose with just a 10 minute treatment time. That's kind of the thinking behind that. Um, and also, this company is is very much into not giving the body too many non-native electromagnetic fields along with the therapy so it doesn't plug into the mains you kind of have it in a battery pack that you recharge um, because that's one of the things of course when you're using energy medicines that you don't want to kind of uh, expose yourself to too many electromagnetic so fields. Understand, this is a rechargeable one so you don't have the emf from the electrical outlet yeah oh that's very good mm -hmm. uh, so then of course we do want to make a device that gets into the brain you know so we have got this device and there are all these wonderful systemic effects and certainly i mean this is something that i do daily i i have it on my gut and i'm really hoping i'm getting to my brain but of course we want to make something that gets to the brain too uh, and if you could have both that's a double whammy then you know that's all good um there are a lot of effects benefits potentially for getting light actually into the brain um and, and these are all things that I know a lot of people in, in your experts are going to be talking about the neuroprotection effects, the brain repair effects, and even things like um, protecting yourself from blue light toxicity and all these other like slightly negative effects we're getting from this different light environment that we all find ourselves in. Um, I mean, this is especially now that we've all seem to have gone online all of a sudden, you know, we're potentially exposing ourselves to more technology. So anything that kind of mitigates against that is going to have a protective effect on the brain. The problem is getting to the brain because, you know, the brain is an all, it's inside the skull, you know, how, how powerful do you have to have the lasers or the, the LED sources to actually get inside the brain? Where can you get in? Um, so so that's a, that was a problem. That's something that we've been trying to think about. And there are entry points, of course, there are holes in the head where you could potentially get the light in. Uh, as you've mentioned, intranasal is one. And, and I know there are a lot of brilliant products that use light, you know, intranasally, and you're getting that irradiation, maybe even getting up to the olfactory part of the brain. Um, so 
that's a super cool way and maybe we even thought maybe we could have like some device that you put inside your mouth and maybe try and irradiate up inside the mouth we had like a gum shield kind of thing going for a while we had like some plastic device that you could maybe put in and put lights for a while ears we kind of had a headphone the forehead anywhere where you have hair of course is gonna also attenuate the light so hair's a problem so we were thinking maybe forehead uh, the brain stem and the back of the neck seems to be a place where you could potentially get light, you know, maybe where you have the join on the back of the neck. There's a lot of work on the default mode network, which is kind of on the sides of the head. And the midline of the brain, you kind of do have sutures in the skull where potentially you could get light in. So these are all the places where we were looking at, okay, how can we exploit, you know, these holes in the head to maybe get the light to where it needs to be. Uh, and this is what we came up with because one of the remits was we didn't want to have something that w kind of looked too kind of weird and futuristic be because of the compliance issue, you know. And this is meant to be a consumer device. This isn't a clinical device. This isn't a research device. This is something that we're aiming at consumers. So we want it to be something that people will actually use and wear. So we haven't gone for any of the kind of the intranasal or the in up the mouth or in the ears we're going for a very simple device something like this this is just an artist render but something like this um, that will now allow maybe contact with little combs at the back to get through the hair and across the forehead where you obviously can get you know you don't have the hair issue uh, and and down the sides where potentially you have that default mode network which seems to be very important certainly for dementia alzheimer's and parkinson's so this is our first pass at making a device that's going to kind of tick a lot of boxes you know uh, and enable us to kind of have you can see here we've got little heat sinks so it shouldn't get too hot we should be able to deliver a fairly high power um led um, without having like great big fans and things on on the side. So our remit really is um, the prevention and relief of, of dementia symptoms. That's kind of our primary target, although of course, you know, it will be a um, standard brain health. Um, it's difficult to separate those out, but that's really our focus. Again, we're not going to have, we're going to try and limit any EMF, so we won't have Bluetooth or any of those things which potentially may cause, you know, an issue if you're having that next to your brain. Uh, we're going to probably use red and near infrared, although we are very open to suggestions actually on the wavelengths. And there's a lot of different data in the research to show which has an effect. I kind of uh, outlined to you the effect of water and so potentially we could use something that goes above 940 to kind of exploit the effect on water or maybe you know it seems that about 810 is very popular in the literature and people are getting some excellent results from from that wavelength um, and the pulsing is also very interesting you know a lot of people use pulsing for these devices um, especially to match brain waves like 10 like alpha and 40 gamma and potentially higher up like in the hundreds tend to have tend to be more for meditation. I know Lou Lim with V-Light is looking at, you know, one and 200 hertz because he's finding that it's helping people with meditative states and altered states. So that's very interesting research. So we're kind of making a device that gives us a range of pulsing. So when we get more data on that, we can modify that as the data comes in. Fairly high power output because to get through the skull, you do need fairly high power. Although again, that can be modulated just by changing the duty cycle that we put out. And the goal is to have something accessible because uh, it, it's just something we think is much needed. And I think a lot of issues with some of the things that, you know, there are some issues with people not being able to afford some products. It's at the moment, it's still, it's, there is a lack of products that, that are in that kind of accessible range. And we aim to use it with the flex beam on the gut so that you have this combination. You know, you can have something on your head, but also something that's giving you the systemic effect, like a double whammy. And I have to say that that's uh, what, you know, I'm in agreement on that. I think this is a great, this is a great development. And, you know, you, and, uh, you know, in my earlier research, in our case report, we did use uh, multi-modal. 
So we used brain, pancranial, so not mm -hmm. spot specific, intranasal, and mm -hmm. a body pad uh, for the things that we talked about earlier. So this is a, I, I agree, dual site or multi-modal applications are probably gonna give you the best bang for whatever the buck that you have. Yeah, <laughs> yes. That's it. And so that this is just the uh, this is the team that the CTO that I'm working with is brilliant. I'm very lucky to be working with him. He, I mean, all of this is him. You know, he does all the technical. Everything's done in house with this company. It's got a very lovely headquarters in Thailand. Um, but so this is Ari and Helder, and he um, is totally the brain behind the company, and and he's putting all of this together. We're also working with experts who we're going to go on to do the research with. So Dr. Leslie Parkinson is a renowned neuroscientist in Harley Street in London, and she's going to be doing some of the testing. I've also been speaking to some experts like Dr. Marvin Berman and Dr. Clifford Sanders, who I think you've also got on your team, and they um, have been giving us some advice, and I'm hoping, you know, maybe to like get the research going because that's really what's needed in this area is, is research to kind of validate all these amazing results and yeah. Well, yeah. I thought that was a, a wonderful walkthrough. Great presentation. I enjoyed it. The, the take home message, the, what do you think about, uh, I mean, you have the products and everything. How do you see the future on this, Sarah? What do you, you know, you have, you're right there. You have a product. Well, how do you see this being accepted or seen in the future? This. Well, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that people, especially now, you know, we have this kind of, we have, this big health issue that's happening right now, where people, I think, are beginning to understand that there is a need for personal responsibility in healthcare. You know, there's a need for people, you know, to react to, to this way, to, to have, to strengthen their own immune systems, to start doing things that are gonna enable them to be more resilient and, res and you know, have tools at their disposal that are gonna enable people to, develop their own immunity. So, so my hope is that this, the research will keep on going. I've seen that there's some uh, initiatives right now to look at photobiomodulation with regards to immunity. Uh, and this is gonna be something that people will be able to adapt and they will be able to um, take on as part of a wellness regime. You know, that people should be doing themselves in their own homes. They should be taking that on themselves. And this is, you know, it's so easy. All you've got to do is sit under some light, you know. I, think so. I, I'm, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And, uh, you know, one of the things is that now we can't even go outside and get our light, so, so they say. So we definitely need to supplement our light <laughs> diet, if you will. Yes. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise with us. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.